Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the UBC Learning Circle, hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We are very pleased today to be collaborating once again with the Indigenous Research Support Initiative to welcome Dr. Priscilla Seti and Dr. Cheryl Light Lightfoot into the circle today to chat with us about Dr. Seti's research as a David Suzuki Foundation Fellow on the impacts of climate change on Northern Indigenous trappers. Uh, before I move forward, all of us at the UBC Learning Circle and URSI would like to extend our warm gratitude to the David Suzuki Foundation in allowing the presentation today to be shared. Um, so uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Hunkamunum speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle. Um, so for today, uh, quick little trigger warning here. The talk, topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Uh, if that is you for today, please make sure that you're looking after yourself. If at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, or family member, please don't hesitate to do so. It's important that we access those support networks when needed. Uh, so very brief introductions. In case you didn't know, my name is Cole. I'm from the Chowthill First Nation. I'll be facilitating the discussion today. Other Learning Circle team members in the room today, um, in digital room today, are Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Winona, our program assistant. Um, also in the room, uh, kind of helping us out behind the scenes, are Emily and Julie from uh, URSI. If you feel so inclined, please introduce yourselves in the chat box as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Cheryl Lightfoot to get us started and uh, kind of introduce or, or set, a, set a pace for um, Dr. Priscilla Setti's work. Thanks so much, Cole, and good morning, everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to be introducing our speaker today and um, get us started off in a good way. I've been asked to give a few opening remarks before our speaker begins about uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and especially to touch on some of the many ways that it can and should and is being implemented, which will give a, a great entree to our speaker today. So I want to greet you properly in my language. Uju Anishinaabe, Ginu Ikwe, Nindishnikaz, Ginu Nindudim, Chi Miigwech. Hello, brothers and sisters. In my language, my Anishinaabe language, my name is Golden Eagle Woman, and in English, Cheryl Lightfoot. I come from the Eagle Clan of Kiwinaw Bay on what the colonizers uh, began to refer to as Lake Superior, uh, but what we call the Great Spirit Lake. And I'm joining you this morning from my home on UBC's South Campus, Westbrook, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And as always, I have to pause a moment and thank them very much for their hospitality, their support, never ending support of our students and programs at UBC, and also, most importantly, their friendship. And I'm delighted to be with you today. It's a great honor for me to be invited to offer a few opening remarks before our keynote speaker begins. And my only regret is that I wish we could be gathering in person, but that will have to wait for now. Um, so I'm pleased to join you virtually. And many thanks to Cole for the introduction and special thanks to the Learning Circle and of course the Indigenous Research Support Initiative for organizing us today. As I mentioned, I'm going to be offering a few opening remarks on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, just a few words about where it came from so that we're mindful of that, and then what is happening currently and what our responsibilities are moving forward in implementing the document. It's important to begin by saying First and foremost, that the adoption of the UN Declaration by the UN General Assembly in 2007 was, to put it mildly, a historic triumph for the global indigenous rights movement. And the adoption of the Declaration owes its existence to the sheer tenacity of that global movement for the human rights of indigenous peoples. And more than that, the Declaration is 
also the fruit of a unique way that the indigenous movement has engaged in diplomacy on the global level. And as I've written in my body of work, the consensus decision-making style of that international indigenous movement, which is grounded in spirituality and rooted in a respect for the diversity of indigenous cultures, has both strengthened the movement and presented to us all in the world an alternative model, a non-hierarchical model, a relational model of how to live and be in the world. And you have to appreciate that right up until the last minute in September of 2007, there were people with in-depth experience of the UN system who were telling us that the declaration would never be adopted. And as you're probably all aware, Australia and Canada, along with New Zealand and the United States, not only voted against the declaration back in 2007, these governments also tried unsuccessfully to persuade other states to oppose the declaration. But today, 13 years on, not only do we have the UN declaration, but it has begun really to take form as a consensus human rights document for the world. And not only have Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States made formal statements now in support of the declaration, but there have been repeated and unanimous resolutions of the UN General Assembly that reaffirm this global commitment to the, uphold the declaration. And more than that, we are undeniably now in an era of implementation. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. Thank you. As I wrote in my 2016 book, Global Indigenous Politics, A Subtle Revolution, the Declaration was the first international human rights instrument in the history of the human rights regime that was developed through the active participation of the rights holders themselves, indigenous peoples. And over a period of more than two decades, indigenous leaders, academics, lawyers, and other advocates from around the world, including many incredible leaders from Canada, traveled year after year to Geneva so that they could sit down with state representatives and hammer out in long sessions, the human rights protections that indigenous peoples needed. I can't emphasize enough how unprecedented it was for the UN system to allow non-state actors this level of access to their halls of power. And this really is a testimony to the incredible strength and fortitude of those leaders who worked so hard to break open those doors, as well as the importance of the values and the approaches that they brought to the UN system. And one of the crucial achievements is the clear, explicit affirmation that Indigenous people are no longer excluded from the universal right of self-determination. The global community has long said that self-determination is an inherent right of all peoples, but nevertheless, they refuse to apply that standard to indigenous peoples. Go ahead and advance the slide. These are just a few of, I think, some of the most important articles for our discussion today. And of course, I invite you to read the declaration in its entirety and become familiar with each and every one of the 46 articles and also the preambular paragraphs. But here's a subset that I think are particularly relevant today. Go ahead and advance. And just to turn for a moment to some of the work going on uh, within governments, particularly in Canada, uh, beginning with implementation legislation. And last November, I had the honor of being in the chamber in Victoria when the BC legislature became the first jurisdiction in Canada and actually in the Commonwealth English speaking world to adopt legislation to begin a path to implement the declaration. And this legislation was passed unanimously in British Columbia by all parties, and it spans a very broad political spectrum. It also reflects a very pragmatic approach to implementation of the declaration. It does not 
simply adopt the declaration into law, but it sets up a process backed by a commitment for the province to work with Indigenous peoples to co-develop the plan. Next slide, please. And the model for the BC Implementation Act is a federal private members bill that was drafted by Romeo Saganash, an Indigenous legal expert, who before becoming a member of parliament had been active at the United Nations during the development of the declaration. And unfortunately, so far, in contrast to the experience in BC, uh, the debate over implementation at the federal level has been highly partisan and it stalled at the last go round. But the Liberal government of the day has promised to reintroduce very similar legislation as government legislation later this year. So that will be something to watch. Next slide, please. But it's important to note, and especially for our discussion today, implementation is not only a governmental responsibility. And in fact, much of the work of implementation of Indigenous rights is done on the ground. And here I'd like to just mention a moment UBC's new Indigenous Strategic Plan, which I had the privilege of uh, serving as one of the leads on as it was being developed. And with this plan, uh, UBC has become the first university in North America to put an explicit and official commitment to upholding and implementing the UN Declaration at the heart of its mission and strategy. And it commits to reviewing university policies and practices to ensure that we live up to the requirements of the declaration. And as part of this plan, UBC is committed to promoting research and dialogue on the rights of Indigenous peoples and creating lots of spaces for these conversations. And since we are considering many of the ways that the UN Declaration can be implemented on the ground outside of government space, I want to say how honored I am to have the opportunity to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Priscilla Sati. Dr. Siti is Swampy Cree from Cumberland House in Saskatchewan. She works on Indigenous women's and Indigenous food sovereignty rights. And I can personally attest to the importance of her on the ground advocacy work in these areas and on the global level. She's a professor of Indigenous studies at the University of Saskatchewan, adjunct professor at the University of Manitoba's Natural Resources Institute, and she's a David Suzuki Foundation Fellow. She's the editor and author of numerous publications and most recently a co-edited book, Indigenous Food Systems Cases, Concepts and Conversations. The title of her presentation for us today is Indigenous Worldviews, Climate Change and the Way Forward for Northern Trappers. So please join me in issuing a warm yet virtual UBC welcome to Dr. Priscilla Sati. Good morning, everyone. I would uh, really like to thank all of the people who made this possible. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Cheryl, Dr. Lightfoot for a good uh, introduction to my talk. And um, even though the length of this presentation does not permit me to get into some of the legal details of how the knowledge that I'm about to talk about describe uh, and present, even though it, you know, this time doesn't give me uh, adequate time to get into the details of you know, the bigger picture, I think that it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, uh, it must be viewed within the tremendous amount of work that's been done to date. So I'll move into the next slide, please. So I'm going to start my presentation um, with an introduction. And I'm going to start with my family background and which leads into Northern Saskatchewan. And um, I'm going to try and shrink this. So on, on the left is the pictures of my two parents. And uh, this was before they had children. And my dad was actually born in 19 uh, or 1898. And he 
He served in the First World War. So yesterday I was reminiscent of the work that he had done as a teenager uh, in supporting Canada. And beside him is my mother. And next to them um, is my dad's mother and my dad's sister. And my dad's mother's name was Priscilla. And she lived to be a ripe old age. Uh, and anyway, I like to start out my presentations with this picture. And certainly this study, I, I want to contextualize my report within you know, a personal frame of reference, which includes not only my family background, but my life experiences training and the influences of many great minds with whom I've traveled this journey. The impact of climate change on trappers' lives is just one in a long list of colonial influences that has impacted and continues to impact Indigenous lives to this day. To appreciate the major life-changing capacity of climate change and how it happens with, uh, requires a lar larger picture to be communicated and understood by ordinary citizens, which I've done in my report. My parents were Treaty 5 land-based people who, like many trappers, hunters, and gatherers, were guided by ways of knowing that honored the land and life that it sustained. Our communities always had customary laws, local knowledges, and forms of development that honored the natural world. This knowledge base, while under threat today from Western development, is vital to ensure that humanity stays on track in a good way. What some might think only as a way of life includes ancient knowledge based on natural laws and indigenous values of service to and provision for others, including showing love, compassion, and respect for all life. These teachings have gathered, have stayed with me for life, even though the state disrupted and tore apart our family. Ironically, after having served in World War I, my father was disenfranchised and lost his legal Indian status, which was ma a major cause of our family disintegration because they were forced to move off the traditional lands that I'm describing this morning. My father and mother represent what I call one of the first waves of hunters and trappers impacted by can Canadian colonialism. Originally, I wanted to work with the Northern Saskatchewan Trappers Association, but COVID-19 limited my work to one fur block that represented my home community of Cumberland House. My ante anticipated research at the annual general meeting of the trappers was canceled because of the COVID virus, and I was prevented from doing interviews and shooting film footage. In its place, I have included research on Indigenous and non-Indigenous organizations that work on climate change mitigation. I was able to do some interviews with trappers from a one, at least one other fur block before the required quarantine took place. Northern Saskatchewan is made up of uh, a number of fur blocks. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of Northern Saskatchewan background, uh, indigenous history and an explanation of colonialism and its impact on our First Nations. So the North is home to hundreds of First Nations and Métis communities that are situated amidst a beautiful and biodiverse setting that has sustained our people for millennia. Saskatchewan was established as a province in 1905, opening it up for new settlers. It uses a developmental model that benefits the settler community over the needs of Indigenous peoples, and not the entire settler community, of course. If we fast forward to the present, we see lands that have been heavily impacted by continuing development, mostly for outside interests. This development for outside interests results in extreme poverty and lack of basic services that Southern Saskatchewanians take for granted. Those include hospitals, universities, businesses, and other services that promote healthy communities 
within a capitalist and wage economy structure. Northern raw materials provide wealth for other places in Saskatchewan, Canada, and the world, as a lot of transnational corporations and company off office operations and the wheels of industry are located in other provinces. <clears throat> Additionally, the three prairie province, provinces share a unique and common feature. For example, an act called the Natural Resources Transfer Agreement, which handed the right to natural resources ownership over to the province. Under the traditional jurisdiction, Indigenous people had unbridled access and usage of their lands. The NRTA effectively and unilaterally transferred ownership away from Indigenous peoples to the provincial government with absolutely no discussion with our peoples. The impact of underdevelopment on the individual is not just an ideological and historical event, but represents a complex state of colonialism and genocide that results in epidemic rates of suicide, particularly among Indigenous youth. Those that don't commit suicide languish in foster homes and in provincial and federal jails as a twisted form of structural racism. These youth share no hope of a future and often turn to gangs for belonging and informal negative economies attributed to crimes of poverty and illegal activities. Many get addicted to drugs and alcohol, continuing the downward spiral of hopelessness. We share the highest rates of kids in care of the state, either through the child welfare system or incarceration. But at the risk of sounding too negative, I'm trying to paint a realistic picture of the problems. At the time I was finalizing my report, a young Tristan de Rocher was camped out on the legislative grounds in Regina, protesting the province's intransigent on the suicide issue. Not one elected political leader from the Saskatchewan party met with this young man. While there are other contributing factors, there is no doubt that economic and political hopelessness contribute to the despair that youth and others feel that contribute to the highest suicide rates um, and community dysfunctions in Canada. These tragedies dictate the need for a new model of economic development. I have included a theoretical framework for that possibility within my study. So in November of uh, 2019, I traveled to Cumberland House with the Aboriginal People's Television Network crew, which was an amazing opportunity for both of us. We were able to film my interviews with five trappers and former trappers and gather 28 hours of film footage. And this story is available on APTN's website, which I provide a link to. So now I'm going to turn to my slide on key findings. The key findings is that climate change is evident in First Nations communities in Canada and Métis communities. Many Canadians are unaware of the circumstances of First Nations and Métis people, including the impact of Western development on Indigenous communities. They see the problem or the impact of underdevelopment and often develop a racist analysis of the problems faced by Indigenous people. There is a need to expand the understanding of average Canadians on the impact of climate change to view our collective situation, but ones that impact land-based people some of who are economically marginalized to a greater extent. So on, <clears throat> I don't know if you have the slide up on the climate change, economic inequality and racism, the, um, which David Suzuki did, I think it was last weekend on the nature of things. But I mentioned that story that show that presentation because in his research Suzuki points to the fact that climate change economic inequality and racism are synonymous and uh, very much shared conditions and it's very evident in my research so 
there is a need to, there is a critical need to develop alternative and green energy systems to mitigate climate change is another one of my findings. And another one is that social economies are growing in First Nations communities as a viable development strategy that should be structurally and financially supported. Another finding is that Indigenous people who stand up to development as defined by the state risk the possibility of criminalization. And while it doesn't hit the news as often as it should, we see cases of people um, in the case of the uh, XL pipeline being thrown in jail and being criminalized and being charged and serving time. And uh, I'm certain Cheryl can speak to the, you know, the numerous killings that happen at an international level, level of people, Indigenous people who stand up to these transnational corporation and their modes of development. The other finding that I want to emphasize is that solidaritist organizations are an important and effective social change tool. And in my study, I mention a number of organizations that are working in solidarity with First Nations and Métis, but I will not have time to go into all of those. Right now, I'm go going to move to my methodology slide. So how I did this study was um, is based on semi-structured interviews with Indigenous trappers and individuals from organizations that are creating sustainable change through research and development in the energy sector. The report draws on academic research from Indigenous studies, social economy studies, and environmental studies. While the report can be used to inform and strengthen an Indigenous approach in the Suzuki foundational work, it can also be used to inspire the important work to support solidaritous relations and strategies between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And I, I mention that because Indigenous people cannot do this struggle alone. And every day, every month, every year, we are finding evidence of more and more people addressing the important uh, topic of climate change and the important work on the ground and within their communities. So now I'm going to uh, move into my interview uh, collection. And if you could pull the slide up of the lovely Cumberland House beadwork. And I am going to proceed with the, uh, just a summary of the um, interviews. So many of my interviews involve the famous carrier clan of which some people here are <laughs> um, on the call, renowned for their knowledge of the land and taking home top prizes for trappers events, including animal calls, bannock baking, flower packing and other endurance <laughs> events. As a guest of the Carrier family, my interviews were more than just staged and taped recordings, but were contextualized and peppered with fabulous family stories, meals, and interruptions by grandchildren, a beloved highlight of all Indigenous families. All trappers I interviewed agreed that because Cumberland House is built on a rich river delta, Food was plentiful and work to get it represented a healthy and cultural, rich, culturally rich way of life. In 1940s, a dam originally qual called the Squaw Rapids Dam was built upstream from Cumberland House and the impacts were devastating. Prior to the dam being built, Cumberland House enjoyed a lucrative and healthy economic, cultural and social life. People were able to earn a good wage from trapping um, $900 to $1,200 a day. They recall getting six to 10,000 sturgeon in one week. However, today, according to Clifford Carrier, young people can't do that. <clears throat> in addition to providing an income, trapping sustained culture and values of hard work, sharing, and mostly stress-free livelihoods. I say mostly because some of the stories I heard were also clearly very stressful. 
uh, due in large part to climate change. The important skills uh, trappers learn from trapping include building relationships with family, but not only community people, but with animals as well. And certainly a number of people I interviewed talked about those relationships with animals and the communications that took place. After the Squaw Rapids Dam, pre pressure forced them to change the name to E.B. Campbell. Um, life changed dramatically for Cumberland House citizens. The impact affected four areas, according to the trappers. The quantity and levels of water from the North Saskatchewan River, the loss of large animals due to migration and impact on biodiversity and citizens. The trappers stated these interconnected impacts were attributable to mining exploration, including dynamite blasts and clear cuts to accommodate the development. Aerial spraying to combat spruce budworms was also a contributor to animal loss. Over the years, people noticed a decrease in the amount and type of animals that lived in the area that included changes in the weather and undependability of ice thickness due to fluctuating water levels brought on by the dam. Moose populations went from 2,500 and 3,000 to almost nothing. In 2019, uh, 18 and 19, when he was outfitting for tourist hunters, tourist hunters, um, one of my interviewees said that he saw no moose for the entire tracking event. Due to the constant disruptions in development, in 1988, Clifford Carrier noticed animals migrating from the north and ending up in farmland south of Cumberland House. Aerial herbicide spraying as a method of killing broadleaf trees was another method of clear cutting that had devastating effects and left many moose and deer sick and coming to the edge of the lakes to die. There were times when he would see seven or eight moose clustered together on the ground dead. He also says that bird populations have dropped to where you don't hear them as many of the trees have died. He claims that those birds took care of the trees and kept insect numbers in check. Trappers mentioned that the taste of food has changed, likely because of the availability of the food for the animals and fluctuating water levels as a result of the dam. The, for example, the fir block ended 28 feet shallower as compared to four feet from the riverbank. And so if you can imagine that, this alone endangered both human and animal life as moose were unable to reach the river from that great a drop. Many beavers starved when the water that their houses were built in dropped 20 feet. Similarly, fish in Cumberland Lake froze in winter when the lake dropped by five feet. The floods of the regions in 2005, 2011, and 2013 were hugely disruptive, and most of the people of Cumberland House were evacuated. Clifford Carrier stayed behind to take care of the sled dogs and people's pets for up to a month. Trees were submerged for that amount of time and eventually died. Clifford learned the language of birds and told of experiences where he watched animals speaking to each other in their animal languages. His dog sleds were particularly communicative. Locals made sure that their quotas were not exceeded and that traps were regularly checked. And this is something that pays attention to, you know, the the knowledge base that trappers have that is so in tune with nature and uh, the other life that uh, depends on that nature. It speaks to the respect for the natural world and a reminder to take only what was needed for sustenance. Although I was only able to interview one woman trapper, a second woman was ill at the time, 
Trappers mentioned the role of women as being central to the role of trapping. Clifford's mother was his best teacher and her role in trapping involved how to set traps, the preparation and stretching, shaping, drying and removal of skins, and of course, preparation of foods that the animals provided. Smokehouses were built for preserving meat and the work was age specific. Younger children started with smaller animals and then moved on to larger animals, including coyotes and wolves, worked on by older siblings and adults. Generally, the mothers were the first land-based teachers. Uh, Bill Carrier was the oldest male trapper that I interviewed. I mentioned this uh, because he spoke about trapper, trappers within a more historical context, context from the Cumberland House perspective. For example, before the treaties were signed, everyone trapped, and he recalls hearing genealogy stories from his parents. During the 1950s, Bill's mother did a lot of trapper, but she was frightened when she saw bear tracks, and he told me then that she had stopped trapping, although her role in the entire uh, trapping a cycle was not impacted. Bill's father made $4,000 in one gillnet lift, which was the same as Bill made in one year working at a local mine. He said that in 1967, an oil company started uh, dumped oil in the river and sturgeon started smelling like oil. He started seeing the impact of climate change in 1974 and into the 1980s. People were drowning in the river because ice was unpredictable. 10 years ago, he was outfitting in the fall when his snowmobile fell into the water. He once fell in when the temperature was 35 below and it took him an hour to get back to his camp. And in his desperate state, he begged his deceased mother to help him. When he told me the story, it was really a powerful story. He identifies clear cuts as a direct cause of climate change. Bill explains that after companies clear cut, they, they plant spruce that don't mitigate, mitigate against plow winds, but rather that leafed trees block extreme winds produced by plow winds. Both B Bill and Clifford described Neuro neurological impacts on their bodies, which they attribute to eating fish contaminated by mercury. And some of you may know that mercury is released into the water when water levels are interfered with. And both men told me personally and showed me some of their physical um, uh, impact on having mercury in their systems. Eventually the fish absorb the mercury and humans eating the fish become contaminated as well. <clears throat> I met with 84 year old Marie Louise McKenzie in her kitchen and we were surrounded by her amazing display of beadwork which she continues to this day. She began her conversation by describing her large family of 13 children and their very influential roles in the community. Two of her children have passed on. She described the devastating impact of the 1970s floods. She stated that most of Cumberland House youth are not involved in trapping and mentioned 1998 was the last year she spent time on her trap line. Her husband had died that spring. In 1990, when she was 58 years old, Marie Louise won the gold medal in paddling and mentioned that she carried the torch in the Indigenous Games. In my last Trapper interview, I spoke with fisherman and small contractor Les Carrier, who um, was a mine of information on Cumberland House history, especially after, quotes, development. He described the almost total collapse of the fur and trapping industry because of the anti-fur lobby of the mid 1990s. I mention this because it is an example of the ongoing colonialism by well-meaning animal rights activists that absolutely devastated important parts of indigenous community life and culture in Cumberland House and throughout fur producing regions of the world 
<clears throat> Similar to Clifford's stories, Les recalls how the E.B. Campbell Dam systematically impacted the muskrat population, an important food source for his people. Les describes some of the inadequate dam compensation, such as 16,000 acres of farmland that is fraught with complexities and does not address community security. He talked about the agricultural pollution runoff and its impact on water quality. An Exxon oil spill impacted Cumberland House water quality for which they were never compensated. The once plentiful sturgeon became landlocked after the E.B. Campbell Dam was built. Commercial fishing that used to take place on three local lakes has not happened in 26 years. Carrier described seeing tumors on fish in the 1970s and that fishing bans were in place for six or seven years. He also discussed the powerful impact on both plants and animals when 4,000 cubic meters of water per second is, a release, is released from the dam. <clears throat> 2007 was the last good muskrat harvest. And probably the largest contradictory economic issue is the fact that the profitability of the water has meant huge gains for, Cumber for the government and the people of Saskatchewan on the backs of the people of Cumberland House. Electricity is provided for Saskatchewan citizens by the square footage of water usage going through the dam. So the province earns income from the use of water that originally made a good life for the citizens of Cumberland House. When Cumberland House elected officials challenged the government, all people over 18 years of age received compensation of $1,000. Less uh, carrier, one of the younger trappers, stated this was merely compensation and not a settlement, implying that one agrees to a settlement, it is usually final. Today, many still feel the $1,000 compensation was a bribe and totally inadequate. The fact that it was given around the Christmas season, people would have a hard time to say no. I can just imagine the conversations of politicians as they imagined how people couldn't possibly turn away money, especially around Christmas. Because our team had traveled to Cumberland House in the evening, our eyes were sheltered from the devastation revealed by the daylight. Traveling back, we witnessed the impact of the dam. All of the black poplar appeared to be dead. From what the trappers described, this was caused by the fluctuating water levels. I witnessed a small part of the devastation, but hundreds of similar stories exist throughout not only our province, but all provinces in Canada. So I <clears throat> have a section in the report called the creation and importance of alliances. And I think I'll just say a few words about these alliances at this point, because I want to come back and discuss that with people um, on this webinar. But what is evident in many of my projects and work throughout the globe is a very important role of alliances. For Indigenous people, allies and alliances give much needed hope, inspiration, and can help break down feelings of isolation, desperation, and hopelessness. Allies, in addition, can use their influence to have essential conversations in places that Indigenous peoples have no contacts and no influence. And allies can challenge dominant racist views that are essential within a class system that creates so much inequality and division. <clears throat> and one of those that I mentioned in the study is called the Saskatchewan Forest Protectors. And while many of the people in that organization are made up of cottage owners, this year and prior, uh, this organization has really stepped up to the plate in part because our province has received notice that 
the region where the SAS forest protectors operate are going to be entirely clear cut. And this is going to have devastating impacts, not only on their cottage life, but on the entire environment of the province. And, you know, the deal was signed by the province with an outside British Columbia company. So the devastation continues um, and really people need to step up to the plate. I'm gonna come back and talk about other allies, but I want to spend some time right now <clears throat> talking about alternatives for the future. So I spent some time interviewing um, energy alternative companies and individuals involved in the trade. I did not focus on community sustainable energy development during my interviews with trappers, but I learned that the entire community of Cumberland House is heated with propane, which is both expensive and not sustainable. This is due largely to the fact that the Saskatchewan provincial government has not prioritized a green energy plan and the infrastructure to lead to it. And I firmly believe as someone working within the university that this is absolutely um, an, an absolute requirement that policy developers need to identify green energy plans. And I'm really heartened by some of the research that some of my younger colleagues are doing in this regard. But many governments, including the federal, remain intransigent to this solution. So one solution that my report identifies is the advancement of green economies through social economic development. And here I wanna describe what are social economies. It is clear from the research that a new model of development is required if we are to mitigate climate change and improve the quality of life. One solution that is represented by Aki Energy follows social enterprise principles. I'll ask to move on to the next slide. So Aki Energy follows social enterprise principles and approaches. Social enterprise development is not common across Canada, but the two provinces that have been involved are Quebec and Manitoba. Simply put, social economies are ones that work to benefit and keep control and profits within the community where they are developed. They require investment and work best when governments support them through funding, as is the case in Quebec. <clears throat> in the case of Manitoba, some of the social economy projects were successful because Manitoba Hydro provided financial settlements for the massive flooding that occurred in Northern Indigenous communities from the hundred and so dams that were established impacting northern northerners. For the purposes of this report, I have interviewed from Aki, uh, workers from Aki Enterprises. So in December of 2019, I visited Aki Industries in Winnipeg and interviewed Darcy Wood, who's the CEO and co-director and former chief of Garden Hill First Nation. Aki Industries is a predominantly Indigenous run alternative energy company and was established in 2013 by co founders Darcy Wood, Sean Loney, Kate Taylor, and Sam Murdoch. Aki helps <clears throat> with ideas training and various steps required for setting up and operating a social enterprise. Aki has installed $6 million worth of energy efficient geothermal energy systems in 350 homes on four First Nations, including seven Manitoba First Nations community. Local employees do the actual work and each venture is a nonprofit social enterprise. Utility bill reduction pays for work creating sustainable and local employment. The local enterprise model, sometimes referred to as the solutions economy model, is sustainable and helps respond to the mitigation of climate change through decreased usage of fossil fuel. 
And it does more by providing solutions to the extreme community poverty by creating local employment. Social enterprises work with community and surpluses go back into the community or enterprise. It is referred to as community-based entrepreneurialism. The mode of operation is nonprofit with a business ethos. Social enterprises can help mitigate climate change through the pursuit of solar and wind energy project and would seize this model of development as a response to changing cultural and economic needs. Regarding traditional economies, I asked Darcy Wood if hunting and trapping were economically viable today. And he stated, even though he grew up within a trapping culture, because of the cost and now distance required, trapping is actually prohibitive for people with limited means. He mentioned that weather patterns and seasonal cycles are changing, affecting the animals. He said, some birds are not leaving and caribou don't follow the same routes. I asked Darcy to talk about some of the challenges and he described what I consider a colonial frame of mind where people are convinced they don't deserve better and that they can't improve their quality of life. This often will show up in absenteeism and no commitment to work in some cases. <clears throat> Aki's response has been the use of traditional knowledge and the seven teachings, some of which include always try, honesty, and respect for others. An important outgrowth of Aki was the establishment of Aki Foods, the Meacham Project in 2015, which he refers to as the farm in a box. Now, most people on this call may be familiar with the extreme food shortages that many of our Northern communities face especially in view of the impact on the trapping and hunting and gathering community. The Meacham project operates with some of the surplus from the energy projects and takes no government funding. When I asked Wood what his proudest moment was, he said, to see the people empowered. Wood and his colleagues believe government need to provide money to buy outcomes rather than feeding the problems. By this, he means that positive change will come when investment provides the condition for healthy communities. For example, it requires far less investment to ensure the availability of healthy foods than paying for diabetes dialysis machines. This is an example of social investment where upstream thinking ensure healthy communities are both planned and supported and surpluses earned in community are put back into the community. There are several areas that I do not cover in this section such as financing of social economies and training, but there are models in place that are successful that can be examined and replicated. In terms of accountability, it is important to note that there is a need for measures to make sure that social economy organization remains true to their values and are accountable. Now, I think I'm gonna take a short break here and because um, I've done a lot of talking and I probably am close to my time limit now. So, I have also included a section on how universities can be more instrumental. But the, the, the piece that I do on social economies is certainly reflective of the work of Aki, but also my work as an academic within uh, my Department of Indigenous Studies that in, includes an entire course on uh, social economy development and how that can be done. So I see it as my role in training young scholars, young practitioners on how to improve what's out there so as to end on a positive note. So I will stop there. Um, and I note in slide 14 is a picture of um, Aki Energy growing 
green economies, if you could pull that up. And then I will take questions or comments from the audience. Thank you for listening. Great, fantastic. Thank you, doctor. I really appreciated your, um, your presentation. Um, and, and also, I know I didn't get a chance, but thank you very much for your words, uh, Dr. Lightfoot. I really appreciated it. We didn't have a chance to, to recognize that during the transition, but I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you very much for, for setting the tone today and, and introducing um, Dr. Seti in a good way. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so pivoting here, uh, there's a few things we're going to have. We have a, a couple of questions from the audience. I just wanted to make an, a general announcement for everybody because we've had several questions about this so far. Um, the video and the presentation, the recording of today will be released both by Ursi and by the Learning Circle, hopefully within the next few days. It'll also be emailed out to everyone that participated today. So if you had to leave partway through for whatever reason, or if you have to jump off now, that's fine. Know that there'll be a, a full recording that will be made available as, as soon as possible. Um, so one of the first questions that we have um, was from Jennifer and Jennifer asks, um, what does a fur block actually represent and how does that kind of um, okay. come into your work? That's a good question. Um, a fur block is an area, and I know there's people on this webinar that, that are more familiar with the exact fur blocks, but Saskatchewan is made up of a number of fur blocks where trappers, as part of their organizational um, development around the fur economy are limited to a certain area. And so uh, other fur, uh, other trappers don't go in that area unless they're members of that fur block. And um, so the, the Northern Saskatchewan Trappers Association was set up some decades ago to help uh, by, the, by the trappers themselves as a means of working more effectively for themselves in the production of their furs. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. Thank you, doctor. Um, so the next question we have from um, an anonymous attendee, um, maybe addressing or this question could be addressed to both of you, but what are the best ways non-Indigenous people can practice solidarity uh, with Indigenous peoples in Canada and BC more specifically? And then as it relates to this talk um, with Northern trappers that are, that are struggling with climate change and, and that sort of thing. Sure. I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on it. Gerald, do you want to start? Sure. Oh, that is a good question. And it's a big question. Um, and truthfully, um, if we go back to the heart of the UN Declaration. And of course, we need to tie it as well to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and their work. And one of the crucial turning points in this society of ours was June 2015, when the TRC came out with its final report and proclaimed unequivocally that the only acceptable definition of reconciliation in Canada is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So prior to that, there were many definitions of what reconciliation meant. Half of them were problematic, um, but that, that particular report settled that conversation. And what that does is tells us that the responsibility should not be solely on Indigenous peoples uh, for the reconciliation project and a, and a resetting project. There is every bit as much responsibility on non-Indigenous society to recognize and respect this entire document of the UN Declaration. And it takes a lot of work. So I think a, a few first steps are, again, read the entire declaration, try to find yourselves in it. What small tasks can you do in your own life, in your own work, in your own civ civic duties, 
pick a few that you can action uh, in, in everyday ways and move forward. And then on larger scales, I think the principle of the declaration and, and living it and working with it is also to begin to build those relationships with indigenous peoples and communities. Listen to what they're telling you. What are the needs? What are the experiences? And, and what are the aspirations? And that will tell you a lot of what we need to know. So in my written report, I name a number of organizations that work in parallel with, with our, with David Suzuki and um, the type of research that I've produced for that foundation. And one of the things, I mean, far too few people are, they'll start, put that right up front. But more people are, more organizations are starting to address, particularly around climate change. And these movements range from very radical to you know, ones that aren't so radical. And I'm thinking of the ones that end up in certain death for people on the front lines. We've had a number of prominent indigenous leaders killed in Colombia, in Central America, and certainly that's been my history with indigenous people since my active days from the 70s, 1970s. And <clears throat> I'm finding that enough, like not enough knowledge is getting out on mainstream media, et cetera. And so people are really unaware. So the first thing we can do is to, you know, have people really educate themselves, attend meetings like this, uh, read up everything you can, listen to people, talk to people, join groups, uh, et cetera. And um, certainly some of the more powerful ones that I'm aware of on the climate change is the Boreal Forest Group in Canada and the smaller group in our province on the forest protectors. And some of them are trappers that belong to that, but largely it's cottage owners. And it seems that, you know, people are learning about the impact. And I see my colleague, Jay Richland, put a question up on, you know, how can, do I believe, do I think that the original state of nature can be returned? Yes, I absolutely do. I think that nature has proven that she is relentless on rising to the mayhem that humans have created. And I do believe that if we can turn around this developmental model of pillage and destruction, that nature will rebound, but we need to do it yesterday. And I think people like Suzuki have been telling us on the nature of things that, that we, it's critical. Greta Thunberg, um, you know, all these amazing young activists and older ones as well that are, are telling us, you know, wake up, find out what's going on and join groups and act because we've got, you know, really very little time left. I think Suzuki, when he visited our campus said that by 2050, all of humanity will be cut in half in terms of numbers. And by 2100, he said we could easily have major human disappearance. So that's quite frightening, but we see it like, what is COVID? COVID is absolutely a reflection of how we have treated nature. And I mean, it's also cyclical in some ways, but I think we get the picture and we really need to be ensuring institutes of higher learning focus on this, not just the end product, but how to mitigate, how to lead up in a good way to models of development that include you know, all life, not just human profit. Absolutely. Thank you both very much for your words. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to, to touch on on that, that uh, yeah, it is, it, it absolutely is cyclical. And, and um, you know, it's a stark contrast. I think one of the things that, you know, you know, when I was younger, and you initially start to learn about climate change, and you start to explore this area of, of research and this body of knowledge, you think that you know, oh, this is this is a contemporary issue and it's a pressing issue, but the reality is that it's not, and it, we can't hide behind an excuse that it is a, a new threat that we are facing. As you've talked about here today, this is something we've known about for 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 decades, even, and um, and we have will, turned a willful blind eye to, and are only we are reaping what we have sown.
You know what I mean? But I think also we need to be mindful that we shouldn't operate in isolation, that we, we really garner a lot from the creation of community. And that's the thing that our communities represent, despite the awful impact of colonialism. What I saw in my home community was strong families that had undergone on, you know, and continue to undergo some fairly major um, challenges, but that spirit is still alive. And, you know, with a bit of support, it could even really, really flourish and, you know, for the younger generations. So yeah, we need to not be operating in isolation, but, you know, taking inspiration from young people like yourselves um, and, you know, really uh bank on that mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much it's inspiring to see someone that's done this work for for so long been involved in these fields and still has such a, a strong degree of hope so thank you very much doctor i appreciate it well that um, comes back from my work with students i mean students are amazing mm -hmm. speaking to the resiliency of our communities and um on that note we have a question regarding the specific um adaptations that individuals are taking within these communities. So specifically, Julie asks, you spoke about some former trappers who said trapping is no longer a viable way to make a livelihood. Um, can you speak to some of the ways that those individuals, families and communities are adapting? How are they, how are they shifting? Well, I, you know, I mean, I mentioned the epidemic suicide rates as a very central feature of our Northern communities. So clearly, large sectors of our communities are not adapting. People live with hopelessness. And so I mention that not to put a super downer on people, but to realize this is serious business. And when the politicians don't even have the courtesy or humanity to come and visit the young man who spent 44 days in, um, on the legislative gr grounds in a fast, there is something bereft in the leadership of this province. Not one politician came to that, his encampment, Kristen de Rocher. But, you know, he, he remains a beacon of hope, this young Tristan de Rocher. And certainly there are hundreds of those youth out there that are doing the same work on our behalf. So while we, we mustn't get caught up in, in the very sad and tragic stories of you know, epidemic suicides, we must take hope from the youth and the people on the front lines who are saying no to this model of development, the destruction of further water sources and lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually have a question that's kind of related to that. Miriam asks, um, two questions. Uh, and the first one being, what can grassroots organizations do to contribute to a paradigm shift in the government's relation to Indigenous peoples, um, the lands and the territories that they occupy and the way that they sell their lands? Um, I think the question kind of comes from a space of, you yeah. know, we see a lot of this institutional action that is, um, you know, that is harmful and, and, and willfully ignorant. But I feel like a lot of, you know, a lot of individuals, again, at this grassroots levels can feel kind of isolated um, or, you know, without, without hope. Yeah. Well, what can ordinary people do? I think that's the question. Um, ordinary people or grassroots organizations. Yeah. Yes. I think that um, in order to make yourself knowledgeable, the extent of the problem, do this kind of webinar, do, you know, put on public events, talk to your neighbors, like really get more structured in how you educate yourselves. You know, turn the TV off, read critical, there's all sorts of really interesting and informative uh, information out there if you dig. I personally always subscribe to alternative media to stay buoyant because it does get, especially during COVID, you're so isolated and you're, thinking, well, what is everybody else doing? So webinar has been amazing. You know, there's over 400 people on this webinar. So if each one went out and even picked up the declaration, imagine, and there's many, many declarations that Indigenous people have worked on 
the food declarations are phenomenal. Like I teach a course on indigenous food sovereignty. You know, they're brief. The, the declarations are brief, but they give a lot of historical information and how to move forward. So <clears throat> I think food, the issue of food sovereignty has the uh, possibility to connect all of us, to see our common humanity, and that's exciting. And it, you know, it can start with something very simple as growing things, working with little children on the wonders of plants growing. But then moving on and finding out what is the federal government doing? It has not established a national food policy. It continues to have migrant workers working in, in really um, human rights abrogation situations. If the people who produce the, the lettuce on your plate get injured on the job, Nine times out of 10, they are sent back home with no compensation. So they are citizens in Canada without citizen rights. And there's a whole um, organization called Justice for Migrant Workers, and they are phenomenal. They are absolutely revolutionary about their approach to food production and the larger issues. So the federal government should be listening to these amazing groups that are working on the food sovereignty issues. And if people want to email me, I'm, I have a lot of information on that. So educate ourselves and continue to make linkages and, and you know, really um, challenge that racist neighbor of yours, you know? Like you, know, you hear these conversations going on about the other. We'll challenge that and, you know, politely, but, you know, say, hey, I've got something, I've got a different, approach to what you're talking about because we know like we just elected the conservative government again and their policies have been white male policies there's only two women i think on their cabinet they're white women so this you know the people of saskatchewan elected these guys and these are the guys that are pushing through pipelines and you know profiting themselves and their cronies it's time to call them out. And you know, Indigenous people are doing it and being criminalized for it, you know? So I cover a number of these organizations in my report about what they're doing, like groups like the Indian Collective. My God, they throw their leader, the state of uh, South Dakota threw their leader in jail. And he, he's got trumped up charges that could, land this young man in jail for decades. So, you know, this is happening while many of the, you know, population is sleeping or just uninspired. And I think once you get inspired, it really is a good place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that sentiment, um, particularly around the dangers of, of living in our echo chambers and isolating ourselves, right? The only way that we can, or in my opinion, it sounds like we share one. That the only way to to create lasting change and to and to to do that is 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 in dialogue, is walking across the aisle, as it were, and sitting with your fellow person and um, chatting it through. Um, there's things that both sides can learn here for sure. So I appreciate that, Doctor Life. But did you have anything you wanted to add to that question? Well, I think. I'm just going to echo what Priscilla said in that I think it's important to read every day, uh, read widely, and um, social media, you know, is both a, a benefit and a bane of our existence, but for Indigenous folks and for a lot of these grassroots movements, it is a major source of connection and information sharing and knowledge sharing, and um, despite its... Um, challenges and its weaknesses. It has been a real strength in the last decade or so, especially for Indigenous peoples and movements on the ground to stay connected and to inform one another. And uh, for example, uh, there's a huge network on Facebook. I know it sounds antiquated to, uh, to young ears, but there is a tremendous global 
presence on Facebook and we, we share news daily. There are several of us that put out news feeds. So we cross reference one another in Scandinavia and down in Australia, New Zealand, here in North America. And no one organized it, but it's become a, 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 an information sharing, just organic uh, device. And we all rely on it. And it's primarily alternative media sources. We're not reading the CBC or, or exchanging news stories on the CBC. We are exchanging stories that are in what could be considered very obscure corners. But that way we all have our, our thumbs on what's happening in the Amazon on a day-to-day -day basis. What's happening uh, in northern corners of Saskatchewan? What's happening with mining and destruction of very ancient sites in, in Australia? We know this in real time and we keep up, up to date uh, daily with these, with these stories. And I invite everyone into that circle uh, because it's every bit as important for non-Indigenous folks who want to act on the grassroots level or influence policy and make change to stay as informed as possible. So tap into our, our networks. We're happy to share. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time here. I'm going to try and get through one or two more questions. Um, so the first one being, excuse me, you talked about, Jennifer asked, you talked about the importance of allies. How do we educate allies about how we see our place in the environment such that our communities do not become vulnerable to modern environmentalism that can be colonial in nature? As an example, anti-fur sentiments. So how can we educate allies about our, our place in the, natural, in the natural world and in our territories um, and what that kind of encompasses? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, like Cheryl said, um, do some reading, like, and educate yourself and, you know, listen to Suzuki. He's amazing. I'm not just saying that because I'm his fellow, but, you know, he is amazing. The work, and, and I'm certain a lot of people have seen, you know, the nature of things, because he also celebrates the beauty of, of the world out there. And get involved, like uh, Cheryl said, you know, there's, you know, check out things like this. Um, maybe take a class, you know, take a class. I know there's a new master's degree in uh, at the University of Winnipeg that my colleague uh, Ian, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his last name now, um, <clears throat> it has produced. So it's on environmental stewardship and economies, new economic development. So, you know, I believe that the whole economic development field needs to be examined very critically and we would need to apply pressure. So you're probably a member of a group somewhere that I'm not, that you would have some influence there that you could, you know, educate yourself and then discuss this with some members of, you know, your peer group. And, you know, that's, that's one way to do it. Education is not doing a good enough job, I find, with the little kids and then in high school and then university. We have armies of young people that are unfortunately still being fed the same old, same old development models. And it's not going to be there 100% when they become, you know, mature adults. And I think, you know, the thing that's happening with the oil fields where hundreds of oil workers get disemployed, unemployed, in a, you know, the drop of a pen is indicative of how capitalism, and I will say that, is treating workers. So that's not good enough. You know, young people shouldn't have to work three jobs to get through, should not have to acquire a major mortgage to go through higher learning. And they should be guaranteed a, a job with dignity at the end. But it'll only happen if we change that, if we change, you know, how our social, you know, how our economies are being developed. I mean, I know that sounds like a broad based statement, but I think, you know, it begins with that awareness that the current system operates to the benefit of a very small elite group. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Lightfoot, did you have anything to add? No, it's okay. Uh, oh, sorry. 
Okay, so just going going forward, we have one more question here, um, which is, I think is an interesting one. Based on the initial high cost of, of sustainable energy um, projects, let's say, particularly coming at it from our current economic model, which is mostly rooted in in non-sustainable technologies and, 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 and um, non-sustainable uh, economies, let's say, um, how willing or how can local governments provide financial support to the local community? And I would actually take it a step forward, a uh, step further and, and add to the question myself personally, do you think that it's, it's on local governments to take that initiative and cover those costs to kind of, um, shall we say, you know, provide, provide leadership and support in moving our, our communities, both at a local and a national level towards more sustainable technologies and trades? Well, certainly Quebec, the state, the province of Quebec has prioritized social economy so that the government prioritizes budgets to support, you know, industry, not industries, but businesses that promote green economies, including daycare. They have the most affordable daycare in all of Canada. And this is because the government intentionally provides funding to families. Like how novel is that? Here in our province, we pay hundreds, thousands of dollars to have children in care so that mothers and fathers can work. So absolutely anywhere in the world that I've researched social economies, it, they, they survived or they, they flourished because governments prioritize them as important. And as my colleagues at Aki Energy say, what is more expensive, operating uh, you know, hundreds of dialysis machines or actually settling land claims so that people can do something about their land? Um, you know, well, I think it does, it's not rocket science to try and figure that out. I mean, but underneath it all, it does not benefit the same 1%, the 1%. Uh, uh -huh. So, you know, you do need to do a critical analysis of the political system that we live under, how things are funded. And there are groups in Canada, um, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, that does something called alternative budgets and or gender related budgets. And so these are budgets that prioritize the needs of citizens as opposed to the profits of corporations. And they're really revolutionary. And they have never been really installed because you know it's radical. But if you start looking at the important area of budgets and how they can support youth and women and indigenous, you know, all the people who are clamoring for human rights, then it's really inspiring. And my job, I get to do that work. And so I remain very inspired by groups like the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, which have a fabulous research base, resource res base, yeah. So. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Layfoot, any other qu uh, comments on the question or, or generally as we kind of close out here? I'm just gonna back up Priscilla on that last point. I mean, governments can afford whatever they want to afford. It's a question of what the priorities are and what the constituents tell them their priorities are because that's what keeps them in office and that's what they're motivated to do. Um, so I think so often the reason given for why things don't change is simply because this is the way we have always done them. And if you really step back and look at that as the rationale, it, it doesn't hold up. There are many uh, points in human history where there have been paradigm, paradigm shifts and, and thinking shifts. And I believe we're standing right on one of those thresholds in our present moment. And we have been for some time. So it's really up to many of us to indicate to governments at all levels, local, provincial, and federal, that things have shifted. And, and we expect the paradigm shift of government to keep up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Thank you both so much. And just finally do what uh, Eugene Levy's son did and take native studies like the U of Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> the young, what's his name? The young Levy? Yeah, I'm not sure. From Schitt's yeah. Shit, Creek. He's taken native studies. It's so cool. It's all online. You oh, can watch yeah, it. That, yeah. 
the chat has informed me that it's Dan, Dan Levy. Dan Levy, yeah. <laughs> Dan Levy, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, thank you both so much for your time. Again, I'm going to do my little outro here that we always do. On behalf of the Learning Circle and of Ursi, I wanted to thank you both so very much for your time, perspective, expertise, and wisdom. We really appreciated it. Um, and again, one more time before I forget, a special shout out to the David Suzuki Foundation for allowing us to, to have this today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but it's just flooding with thank yous from 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 people all over the all over the place. So um, yeah, I think the presentation was really well received. Thank you both. In terms of the learning circle, we only have one more event for the for the year scheduled, and that is um, Indigenous birthing um, amongst or in in the pandemic. We're really excited to have the uh, Indigenous Doula Collective join us for that conversation in December. Um, until then, everyone take care. Um, and we'll see you next time. Hey.